chapter 20. Now, after telling about the red heifer sacrifice, the ashes for purification, we come to the time whenever they return unto Kadesh Barnea, where they had first sent the 12 spies. And this is believed to be in the 40th year that they've been in the wilderness. We're not actually told much about the 40 years or the 38 years in the wilderness that they spent after they left Sinai. We're not told much about it. So we skip ahead in Numbers 20. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin. In the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh, Kadesh Barnea, to the south of Israel. And Miriam died there and was buried there. So the older sister of Moses dies. And I think it, real quick comment on this, I think it no coincidence that the name Miriam is given unto that of Moses. I mean, just look at the company surrounding Moses and then compare it to the company of Christ. Miriam, another name for Mary, the mother of Jesus. And then you have Joshua, the assistant to Moses, in whom Joshua is just another name for Jesus. And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. And I like Gill's comment on this. There was no water for the congregation, which was so ordered by the Lord for the trial of this new generation, to see whether they would behave any better than their fathers had done in a like circumstance for the first year they came out of Egypt. And why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into the, uh, this wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have you made us to come up out of Egypt, to bring us unto this evil place? It is no place of seed, or of figs, or of vines, or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. Catch this, speak ye unto the rock. He shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beast drink. And some of you may be wondering which rod this is. Is this the rod of Aaron, or is it the rod of Moses, uh, also called the rod of God? Well, it's believed to be the rod of Moses, because in verse 11 we're told that it is with his rod. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord, as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? Now many people have been very confused concerning this. I've heard some people say, No, the Lord commanded Moses to smite the rock. Well, right here we're told that he's telling them to speak unto the rock. Okay, but there are two different instances and it was in that instance where the Lord says, strike the rock. Well, in this one, he says, speak unto it. In 1 Corinthians 10, 4, though, Paul the Apostle, he tells us about what this rock symbolized. And they did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. But Moses says, must we fetch you water? Out of this rock, we. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. He did not speak to it, not even once. He doesn't even try to speak to it, he's just angry. And with his rod he smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly. And the congregation drank, and their beast also. You see, I'd watched a scene portraying this event in a movie made about Moses and them wondering and all. And it shows Moses, he tries speaking to the rock first. Moses, in all reality, never even tried speaking to it. That's very important. And we're actually told about the reason why the Lord sees why Moses didn't even try speaking to it. It's because he did not believe that it would work. 
He didn't believe. He thought, well, I'll have to strike it. He thought it was something that he had to do. Instead of just relying upon God to do it, he thought he had to do something. I believe this is a showing of the law where they believe that their works have to be in play instead of just believe. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, because ye believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. So once again, let's put into perspective Moses' transgression, because he even begins by talking to them with the wrong heart. He says, here now ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? Instead of God bringing the water, Moses says, well, I'll do it. It's a type of uh, the rock being a type of Christ and how they would strike him, I believe. And in this instance, Moses appears to represent the law where grace was the means of bringing forth the life-giving water. It was immediately following this unbelief of Moses where faith was required instead of any action on his part that we see how Moses was restricted from entering the promised land, showing how those under the law are condemned. And of course, these things are symbolic uh, Moses, definitely a man of God, very beloved. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. And Moses sent messengers from Kadesh unto the king of Edom. Thus saith thy brother Israel, thou knowest all the travail that hath befallen us. Now they're going to try to make their final journey up here to cross over the Jordan. And just for a really quick history on the Edomites, thus saith thy brother Israel, Moses wrote. The Edomites, as the descendants of Esau, remember Esau and Jacob, the brothers, who received the name of Edom, Genesis 25, were closely connected with the descendants of Jacob. How our fathers went down into Egypt, and we have dwelt in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians vexed us and our fathers, and when we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel, and hath brought us forth out of Egypt, and behold, we are in Kadesh, which would have just been just to the left bordering on the Edomite land, a city in the uttermost of thy border. Let us pass, I pray thee, through thy country. We will not pass through the fields or through the vineyards, neither will we drink of the water of the wells. We will go by the king's highway, which is the quickest route. We will not turn to the right hand nor to the left until we have passed thy borders. And Edom said unto him, Thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with the sword. And the children of Israel said unto him, We will go by the highway, and if I and my cattle drink of thy water, then I will pay for it. I will only, without doing anything else, go through on my feet. Cambridge commented at this point, This was the first of a series of hostile acts, the very first, prompted by a vindictive jealousy, which brought down the wrath of God upon Edom, as we learn how the Lord's anger against these Edomites just builds and builds from here on out. And the Edomites replied, Thou shalt not go through. And Edom came out against Israel with much people and with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his border. Wherefore Israel turned away from him. And the children of Israel, leaving the whole congregation, journeyed from Kadesh, and came unto Mount Hor. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in Mount Hor, by the coast of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron shall be gathered unto his people. For he shall not enter into the land which I have given unto the children of Israel, because ye rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. Take Aaron and Eleazar his son, and bring them up unto Mount Hor. And strip Aaron of his garments, and put them upon Eleazar his son. And Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, and shall die there. And Moses did as the Lord commanded. And they went up into Mount Horm in the sight of all the congregation. So now there's a new high priest, the son of Aaron, Eleazar. And Moses stripped Aaron of his garments and put them upon Eleazar, his son. And Aaron died there in the top of the mount. And Moses and Eleazar came down from the mount. And when all the congregation saw that Aaron was dead, they mourned for Aaron thirty days, even all the house of Israel. So now we see Miriam dies. Now Aaron dies, and Moses himself hasn't got very long, and then the children of Israel are going to embark on this campaign. They're going to cross over. Jer I mean, just huge, huge things are happening all at once after a steady time of nothingness. Me and my pastor friends, we call this uh, the twister of life, how life will seem very mundane, and then suddenly all at once, within a matter of days, everything seems to start to shift. But Aaron dies. 
and he passes down this high priesthood unto Eleazar. And in Hebrews 7, we're told about how Christ is the true high priest. And they truly were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, Christ, because he continueth forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Now the high priest is always Christ, who is the mediator between God and man.